Hey, Carrie. Hey, Sandra. You are awesome. Yes, I you. am. This is what awesome looks like. And you look awesome. I needed it. This was an early morning video for me. We needed a little awesome sauce today, people. So sorry. Yeah, because I'm I'm back on the road in Madrid and we interviewed. <gasps> dun, 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 dun. Awesome, extraordinaire, mezzo extraordinaire, Kate Lindsay, people. Kate Lindsay. Kate Lindsay. What? Yep. I know. And she is living in the UK and has been able to sing a little bit during the pandemic. But she was able to uh, produce a recording that seriously, people, you need to check out. Girano. Yep. Yes. Please check it out. Amazing vocals amazing project because it really came from the heart yes and it came from what we're living through right now not only the pandemic but civil unrest and what's happening in the u.s with leadership etc cetera, etc cetera. so definitely check out that recording we talked a good deal about that in this interview and about why and her emotions through all that which is really super cool but i just love this girl this amazing career that she's had for quite some time now and being based in London during the pandemic, we had to talk about that. So definitely- no longer being a young artist. Thank you. Uh, hello, she's not a young artist, people. I don't know why people keep thinking that when they write about her. Maybe because she still looks like she's 25. She Lucky girl. Mm -hmm. I know, but we had a really a great chat and we hope you all watch this video. And I forgot to say, um, Carrie, who are we? Come on, people. We're the screaming dittles. Oh, I love the acoustics in here. That's oh, yeah, you got good ones. Nice job. Yeah, thanks. All right. So oh. check out this clip, people. Please. And thank you for watching. Thanks for watching, everybody. You make our hearts happy. Stay safe. Bye. <laughs> Bye. You know, I, I'm... I just don't, I feel um, um, much more satisfied in life by having con real connections with people, um, human to human connections. And I'm not sure I've had many moments where I've gone on social media and actually felt good when I, mm -hmm. when I put my phone down. How many times do we walk away and say, that felt great. <laughs> <laughs>
all of a sudden I don't really have to worry about it so much. Yeah, it's like I love that. Okay, Sandra's really good with makeup and all that kind of stuff. Makeup for me is very hard. Um, and and not, honestly, off over the year of doing these videos, I'm looking at myself going, girl, you need to watch some YouTube videos. <laughs> Actually, I caught I caught one of your recent videos because I was like, okay, what what am I getting myself into? What do I need to? Do? <laughs> and you still <laughs> showed up, so thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is really fun. Like, actually, it can be just sort of some nice some nice chat with colleagues. But um, I was really admiring your makeup. I was thinking, oh no, I really <laughs> I need to put on a little bit more makeup today. <laughs> well, you see, I'm, I might be a few years over forty years old. <laughs> Um, so you see, I can't go with the no makeup look anymore, you know? <laughs> especially when you're blonde and you're not naturally blonde when I'm naturally, you gotta, you gotta color it up a little bit, huh? Yeah. And I, we, my makeup artist here in Madrid, officially, I don't know how they say it in Spanish, but officially I am whiter than a ghost. That's the color that they, they say my skin tone is. <laughs> they had to go out and buy new makeup for me because they didn't have the shade of white. What happens when you get sun? I bronze like that. Really? So you, you don't go into burn and then like? Nope. Carrie too. Carrie's, Carrie tan. You, do you turn red? I turn red first. I have to get through the red zone and then and then maybe eventually I tan. But now, now as I'm getting older, um, like I'm not really sure it's worth it anymore to even try to get that tan. I mean, yeah. when I was young, I wanted that tan. Right. But yeah. now, well, you know what? And and then as you get even past 40, you start getting these lovely things called sunspots. <sighs> Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm starting to get some of them. That is, I'm sorry, but that is why we go get fillers, even though I haven't done it yet, people. I haven't, but I'm about it. <laughs> okay. it, it. You know, it's 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 always in the back of your head. Yeah, like I dermatologist, I get these when I get sun. I get these little, yeah, fifty two. Yeah. So you know, looking forward to it. Oh, oh good. Oh, oh, okay, okay, so you're forty. I want to just say something. How many reviews still say young artist Kate Lindsay? You know, actually, I I really started to ask a few years ago. I've never gotten really picky about like biographies and things like that. But a few years ago, I started to say, I'm not, I don't think we should keep putting this in the biography, like graduate of this young artist program. And it's not that I don't want to credit um, the young artist program, but people think that you just recently got out of the young artist program. And, all, and it's so funny, I don't know if you found this in, in your careers where like you're a young artist and then it's literally, it's like in the span of one year, it just flips and uh, like, and then I started to walk, it was 2015 for me. I think it was, well, I was 34 at the time. And I walked into um, uh, like a first rehearsal for Marriage of Figaro and all of a sudden I was like one of the senior people in the room and it, and it's, it just flipped like that. It really felt like from one production to the next, all of a sudden something flipped. And that was that was a little bit hard to digest. I wasn't quite ready to take on the role of being one of the older ones. <laughs> and it happens overnight, doesn't it? And you yeah. just go, oh, wow. Yeah, is that normal? Did <laughs> yeah. a young artist, you know, like I still get in my bio, you know, graduate of the Lindemann Young Artist Program. Well, I'm so old, it wasn't even called the Lindemann Young Artist Program. <laughs> I, think that that, I think that that happens with more of the Mozart roles than it does any of the, I find that with the Mozart ones when I go back to that, but I don't find that when I'm walking into Verdi or, or some Puccini, it depends on which one it is, but yeah, Mozart, it's harder because all of a sudden it's the young ones are doing it, so. Yeah. And not that we are not young. Hello. I mean, look at our, our faces <laughs> and our skin, people. Gorgeousness. No one looks their age on this video. I have to just shout that yeah, out. Age oh, wow. is how you feel, right? That's what exactly. they say. But I don't know if that would work so well for me because I feel like I'm creaking around all the time anyway. <laughs> uh, 40? Really? Like, yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, well, yeah. I've, I've, it, 40s hit me a little bit this year, but it's probably because of the pandemic as well. Because when you're working a lot, you're just, you're staying, your body is a lot more active. And then right. with the slowdown with the pandemic, even with exercise, it's not, it's not the same as being in a room and moving your body in the way that you do when you're 
performing. Right. And, and I've, I've found it actually just physically sort of a harder year. I don't know how, how so. I mean, we've also moved house and all that stuff too. So okay. there's been a lot going on, but, um, but I just feel sort of creakier. <laughs> I, I totally agree with that statement because you are not traveling to and from places anymore. Yeah. You're not carrying a bunch of groceries because everything's getting delivered or whatever it is. I mean, you were just not physically moving. Sandra and I talked about this a lot. It was that 45 minutes on the Peloton bike, bike didn't cut it anymore. I mean, that was just like the extra on top of your day. So all of a sudden I noticed my hips were hurting and I'm like, okay, listen, people, we are not 85. Like, why are your hips hurting? This is crazy. And I realized because a lot of the time I was sitting more than I ever had in my entire life. Mm-hmm. But um, also, okay. for, sorry for me, like getting back, you know, I was, I've been practicing, you know, every day, blah, 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 blah. But not having done a run of an opera for 18 mm-hmm. months, like yes. I did a performance here or two performances there, but you know, this is now I'm going on my fourth performance. And my body's like, and my throat's going like, what are you doing? Like, I don't, I don't remember this. Mm-hmm. No. Wow. So, I thought, um, I, I thought you'd been working fairly, like you've been, you've been up on stage quite a lot, mm-hmm. like in the past, Catch in the past, what, sort of six months, eight months. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I've been really lucky, you know, and, and, but it's not been consistent. Like, you know, all three of us would just go from show to show to show to show. And now it's kind of like show, oh, go home for a month, do some yeah. screenings, and then go do another two performances. But to do f- like a, a rehearsal period, proper rehearsal period, proper performances. Yeah. And you're in a long run right now, right? It's a pretty long run of shows. Eight shows, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. What my- I... What I found was surprising, um, uh, I just finished, well, I finished last month in Vienna. And when I, when I left to go to do the show, like we had no idea if the theater would open. We had, you know, you just, you go and you think, well, we'll find out when we get there, what's going to happen. Um, and I thought for sure we'd get, you know, somebody would get a positive test and we'd have to all get delayed, all of that. I said, I was thinking at best, we'll do one performance that is sort of recorded, video recorded live, and then we'll be done. And um, and I couldn't believe it when we were actually able to open and do the full run of the shows. But no. I realized when we got to the run of shows, we got through opening night and it was like, well, I gotta go, I gotta get out of here. <laughs> like, I'm not used to staying any longer to do more shows. I was like, I'm, I gotta, what's going on? I don't, I don't wanna hang out, we gotta get going now. <laughs> I don't get this. I don't get what's going on. I know. Are are you able to travel with the whole family, or or did you just go by yourself? I went to Vienna. I went with with my son. So I've got uh, Finn is almost. He'll be four in October. Okay. So actually, the tricky thing, the trickiest thing about this past sort of six months, as as work opportunities have sort of trickled back in, um, like just before that, I'd been in in Italy, and it was it was. Under normal circumstances, you know, La Scala calls and says, hey, we want to do this project. It's definitely going on video where we have no hope of opening to an audience, but we want to do Court Vile's Seven Deadly Sins. Um, and so, so we sort of knew, we knew that we weren't going to open for pu- a public. And um, but the tricky thing was that I would have to go and as we've all had to do, make decisions based on having to go in quarantine for two weeks, you know, when you show up and then, you know, you anticipate as well having to come back in quarantine. But for me, it was going away for six weeks when I haven't, I hadn't been away from my son or my husband in a year and a half, actually, yeah. because we've all been traveling together in 2019, just before the pandemic. Okay. I've been having a lot of anxiety about just leaving yeah. for that period of time because mm-hmm. when you're gone you cannot get back I, I mean you you really are there you have to just you have to plant yourself there and that was it was you know under any other circumstances it would be like yes hello I'm there but um but with this um I, I really had to give it some thought and we really had to talk through it and that's been the nature of things 
through this whole time and that's mm -hmm. the way it's continuing and I, th I find that the most difficult thing because what happens is it's already difficult enough with with family life or you know with couples but then to know that you can't see each other for that period yeah um, makes it makes it really tough so I can't yeah, yeah. I can imagine that yeah so but you know we've I'm also just grateful for the work so uh yeah. <laughs> Sure. No, it's a catch 22, isn't it? Yeah. How, how was it living in or around London during the pandemic? Was it totally insane? Well, thankfully, we at that time, we lived in Brighton, which is by the water by right. the English Channel. So we when the pandemic hit, we were in New York, I just finished up at the Met doing Agrippina. Um, and I was actually sort of in a waiting game to know whether I was whether the next contract was going to start at Los Angeles Opera. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the irony is you look back and you think, oh my gosh, like never, never would anything have happened. But they weren't, <laughs> weren't canceling yet because nobody really knew. And I think you, I think legally, you know, you need this, the state or the city to tell you you can't open. Mm -hmm. and I, I don't know if I leave the country, then they might be upset with me if they actually do want me here in another few weeks time. Right. Um, but finally, we were just worried about the borders closing. So we raced okay. back here and I was so grateful actually to not be in London, especially with a two year old, two and a half, yeah, he was two and a half years old at that point, wow. because it was, uh, we just, thankfully we could get outside and we were close to the English countryside. We okay. could get next to, you know, next to the water because just so much was, so much was locked down and I sort of went from working, 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 working to then actually feeling quite burned out at that time. And then we got into the lockdown and my husband who makes documentary films mm -hmm. was able to pick up some projects immediately, which we were so grateful for. But then I was just full on with childcare. <laughs> and I just, I just remember I get like to the end of the week and I was like, oh. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there was, we, we were, yeah, we needed a drink by the end of the day. That was for sure. <laughs> uh, I was so relieved when I spoke with a friend up in London who has two kids. I was so relieved to hear her say, um, without any shame at all, she was like, I was not meant to be a stay at home mom. If that had been part of the bargain for me, I would not have done it. I was I I like to work, and yes, I love my kids, but I was not meant to do this twenty four seven. Right. And I thought, I'm so grateful to hear someone say that because I feel guilty saying that. But I, you know, I, I have I like I bow down to people and moms and dads who do stay at home with yeah. their kids because that it, it's a hard it's hard. It's, it's a, a full time hard. job. It's a full-time job and it's also lonely. It's a pretty lonely existence. I mean, you've got to be really good about trying to connect with people mm -hmm. and with, you know, it's, but it, it's just, it is just exhausting and it's hard to get out of that space. You have to be really mindful. I started to just, I started running again during that period because I needed a reason mm -hmm. to get out of our home. Right. <laughs> Well, did it change? Did the pandemic change your outlook on life, like in your career uh, and career and everything? It did. I mean, on a lot of levels, I think. Number one, I the thing is, I'm a homebody. I don't really love traveling. I mean, I don't know how how you guys feel, but I love to sing, and I and I enjoy the performing. I really enjoy like the creative process, but I don't love living on the road necessarily. Um, I don't love the travel aspect of it. Um, I always feel, you know, when you sort of start that, that travel again, it's you're, you're immediately displaced into the unknown, yeah. which is a good practice for us. Mm -hmm. But, but the repetition of that through a year can also really wear on, I, for me, it wears on me a bit. Um, because you're always sort of on hyper alert with with everything and in traveling with the kid has made it slightly more so because there's so much more coordinating with child care and things like that as well um so I didn't I didn't miss the travel um and I also found that what I started to do just to try to stay in shape 
what, what was funny was that everybody was doing videos in the beginning. And Sandra and I, you know, we have the same manager. Right? <laughs> and, and I was saying to them, I mean, I really started to get quite tense about this because I sort of just needed a bit of rest at the time. Plus I was sort of full-time childcare responsibility. And I said, do I need to be producing videos in order to stay relevant? Is this mm -hmm. what it's coming to? I know. Because that, that, that's not really what I probably, I would say I signed on to do right. with this work. That's not really what makes me tick. It, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it's not something that comes very naturally for mm -hmm. me as well. And so, um, so I was really struggling with that. Like I just needed some, some time for quiet and to process. Yeah. And what I ended up doing during that time, thankfully we still had nap times. <laughs> so a couple of hours in the afternoon, there was nap time. And I would go and I just started picking up scores off of the bookshelf and just picking up things that I hadn't, I hadn't really visited probably since the last performance. I closed mm -hmm. the floor and you put it away for several seasons until somebody asks you to do it again. So it was really nice actually just to sit down and pick things up just because, and not because I had a deadline, not because I had to learn anything for any specific mm -hmm. project, but just to, just to sing through things. And I ended up singing a lot of Mozart. It just felt, that felt really, that felt good. It sort of. Yeah. yeah. Gary, Gary loves Mozart. I love it. It's just the foundation of everything for me. It just brings yeah. the voice home. It brings everything healthy. I just, I just like it. I don't know. Yeah. I've always loved it, but yeah. We all yeah. have to have our baseline, you know, and I think it's so good to come back to it. it it's funny because people, it seems like in, in all the interviews we've done, they either put music way aside during the pandemic or they embraced it. And there was no middle road on that. It was no, not, there it really wasn't. wasn't. Not a, isn't it carried like yeah. not at all? or wow. Yeah. Okay. So when did, when did your new CD, the Tirano come? How did that play into the pandemic? Tom that, that played into things. Um, I started to feel like I was coming out of whatever, wherever I was. I started to sort of come out of that in June and I was, I started to, think oh I think you know why I came out of it because finally we could put Finn in nursery for a few days a week so <laughs> I had I had some space to think about other things right um 2020 um yeah in 2020 okay. yeah in June 2020 so I started to um chat a bit I think chat with the the manager of the orchestra the group that I was working with Julian um uh, I was talking with him and he manages Arcangelo and we'd had, we'd, we'd worked together on the previous album that had come out um, in January of 2020, actually. And I hadn't anticipated doing anything very quickly because um, there wasn't much time, but now all of a sudden we had this time and I thought, but so we have time and probably we have a lot of musician availability. Mm -hmm. um, like our, our calendars are not so complicated at the moment. Maybe this is the time to build something. And so it all happened fairly quickly, um, but, but the idea around it, it's always, you know, you wanna build something, but you have to sort of start from some sort of seed repertoire wise mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. build some programming that feels feels like it takes you somewhere, you know, has a bit of an arc to it. And so um, I, I was talking with their librarian who does a lot of like music research, James Halliday. Um, he's a great, he's uh, just a great researcher. He can, he can sift through and find a lot of stuff and he knows where to go to look for stuff. Um, and he was sort of sending through some initial thoughts because we were wanting to focus on Scarlatti. There's like oh. hundreds and hundreds of these Scarlatti cantatas out mm -hmm. there that, you know, there's, I mean, there's just huge amounts to sort of, to be able to pick from and look at. Um, and then in the course of looking at some of those things uh, and listening to some discs where some of these cantatas were, there was one cantata that popped up on a disc and the first line of it was, Io son Neron, l'imperator del mondo. I am Nero, emperor of the world. 
And something about that sort of hit, number one, yes, because I've sung the role of Nero, that, that there's something immediate about that. But at the same time, you know, I remember very vividly, you know, with the George Floyd killings and the state killing in the States, I would sit there, I was watching like PBS Frontline, like, mm -hmm. or, you know, PBS News the next day and like just in tears, you know, watching everything happening on the news. And with that, with, with the US elections coming up, um, riots in Belarus, like oh, just all this, you know, great unrest even here in the UK, anger towards the government about mm -hmm. how they handled the, the right. pandemic, all of this, it's just this huge distrust of leaders and politicians and what what's happening, um, sort of the like corrupt, the, the corruption of power in a way. Um, and I started thinking, actually, Nero, this guy, he's he's very current, it's very real, it's very modern. And and I feel like I can I could talk about something like this. Like I can actually talk about it passionately <laughs> mm -hmm. rather than to like do a disc about like sleep or something. <laughs> <laughs> or like, we all like to sleep. Okay, good. <laughs> Try for eight hours. You know, I, I listened to your interview with um, Opera Box Score for the Dallas Opera Network. Oh, yeah. And I, I heard you talk about this and I, I found it really kind of fascinating, especially. I mean, now that you've told us how that all happened through the pandemic, but I was also curious in how it helped you process all those emotions that we all had throughout that. I mean, it was, I, the emotions of just the pandemic, of the civil unrest, of the government, of all of it, it was just so enormous and we all processed it and are still processing it in so many different ways. But I was wondering if that project helped heal some of those emotions for you or did it? Did, was it yeah. cathartic? It I was mean cathartic. Yeah, it was cathartic. Like the healing of it all is, I mean, in a way, how do we heal? I, well, healing, I think, actually requires like connecting with other people. Right. And, and I mean, I think there's deep, you know, overall, there's like really deep healing that has to be done between differing sides of opinions True. as well. Um, and so there's, there's, I think there's a lot bigger stuff there, but I think it definitely came from a place for me where I was feeling really powerless and I was grieving a lot. And I, I'm not someone, I, I don't, I don't navigate social media really well in that. I don't, I don't, I don't do a lot of sort of I don't know to what end it matters if I'm like gabbing about it on social media necessarily. Right. Um, because for me, it's, it's, it's sort of more noise about it. And so, but, but there's the sort of the deep sorrow as you're seeing, you're seeing, uh, you know, people in, in a lot of pain right. um, and suffering and, and feeling powerless, mm -hmm. you know, a collective feeling of, powerlessness and distrust mm -hmm. and so I was really I think for that reason I thought actually the most useful thing I get I suppose I could do for myself and overall is to sort of look at a figure in history mm -hmm. and I've always marveled at the fact that I think historically you know, maybe sort of, is it generation to generation or maybe it skips a generation. I feel like we do, we have these cycles of repetition yeah. that happen yeah. <laughs> through the years. And, and it's only the people that really look at the history of it and sort of examine the breakdown of society during this point that can sort of see it starting to happen again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that I think definitely the growth of, of, you know, racism during the Trump era as well, the excuses people had to take more violence against, you know, uh, well, against anybody that they believed was, um, was undeserving of citizenship yeah. or recognition or whatever, you know, that sort of thing was really concerning. And we've lived that, we have lived that all already. So I thought, what could be interesting is to really examine a a person um, 
in in our own history really that um, that has sort of lived that power in a different way. And I also wanted to look at, I really wanted to think about what power does to us because mm -hmm. I, I don't think anyone that enters, I mean, I wanna give people the benefit of the doubt. I think when you enter into a power position, I think people have good intentions. They want to do well for the people that they represent. They, they want to do well for their citizens or for the people that are, work in their co company or whatever. But then of course there are always these sort of pressures that come into play. And then also you don't wanna lose your position when you have that level of power. Mm -hmm. And then you start to give on certain things and maybe you push your boundaries, you edge your sort of ethical boundaries further and further. And it's been shocking to sort of see that happen with politicians, shocking and disappointing to see that happen with Hugely politicians. Hugely disappointing. Yeah, and I think what I've also started to really think about, you know, during these past few years um, is it's not, like, I really don't want to assume the like us against them. Like I, I'm my way is the right way in there. You know, I, I am educated and they are not on this or whatever. But what, what really has struck me um, especially when you look at the election and the results of the election, is that there are a lot of people that maybe need to be listened to and understood a little bit more. And of course, the polarization of, of how we watch our news and take in our news and even how we get our information off of social media has mm -hmm. exacerbated that. Yes. But actually, there's, there's a large portion of society, I think, that does feel that they've sort of been left behind and their right. needs have been left behind. Right. So like, how do we have that conversation? <laughs> well, you know? it, I mean, social media, let, let, because you don't have a huge presence on social media. Wait, 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 wait. Can we first just say that your album, this album, people, you need to go listen to it. It was a huge right. success, amazing. I love the photograph with the neck, the yeah. painted neck band on it. I mean, very, very powerful image. So yes. I just, I have to tell people, go listen to this. Not only listen to our interview, go listen to Opera Box Score interview because that was really um, enlightening. I love that. And so I just needed to say that here on the deep with people, pay attention. Okay. <laughs> Check it out. Thank you. It's really good. And it's amazing singing. Yeah, and gorgeous. The whole package, beautiful. I and love, it. I love how you went went there. And you there's know? a documentary a documentary on that I watched of that process, which was really cool to watch too. So find it on YouTube, people. Hello, I'll put a link in the description below on this video. Okay, there you go. Yay, we love you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So let's let's okay. talk about social media. media. All right. And and why you don't have a huge presence on social media, because I think I know why. And I think our manager both wants, wants both of us to be more on social media, but. Okay, yeah, also, sorry, the latest on social media, Instagram is like now about videos. They want videos, they don't want pics anymore. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I really don't want, who wants to hear me Gavin on the, it's one thing to do this, it's another thing to get on like reels, or TikTok. I mean, really, what do I have to say? Do you want to watch my dog slobber? I'll show you that. <laughs> no. So anyway, so I mean, uh, sorry, with all these changes in social media, it's it's madness out there. So yes, so back to Sandra's question. Sorry, Sandra. No, I can't I can't keep up with it, but also um, I just don't like to put on makeup that much. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I love it. Finally, somebody tells the truth. It's yeah. like, I'm oh my gosh. Makeup on. Oh. Yeah, and I also, I don't want to, I actually don't want to ruin moments with people by asking to do a photo for social media. It's, it's, I've really struggled with that. Some people can do it like really smoothly, yes. but, you know, I, 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 I just don't, I feel, um, um, much more satisfied in life by having con real connections with people um human to human connections and i'm not sure i've had many moments where i've gone on social media and actually felt good when i mm -hmm. when i put my phone down how many times do we walk away and say that felt great 
<laughs> I, also okay. like I I'm sorry I really don't want to see and maybe it's just because I am a singer because warm up like my version of hell is listening to other singers warm up so if somebody is putting their warm-ups on the on the Instagram I'm like I love you but I mute uh-uh <laughs> next well actually this what this year too i had trouble sort of getting my head around posting a lot of stuff when i was lucky enough to be doing something ironically i because i i know what it's like to you know I, i've been on the other side of it where you don't have any work nothing's going on the pandemic has shut everything down and all of a sudden you're seeing other people getting to do stuff yeah. and yeah you're happy for them but it it I don't, does it, does it make people feel good? I don't know. You know, um, I mean, I, I've been sitting at home for the whole time since March, whatever, 13th. And I will say this, I, um, I embrace all of those emotions because I know so many people that have been like me have felt that way. And there was such a love of the performers that were out there posting in a way that made it all okay in a way because I was so thrilled that that somebody was actually making music it made me happy to see that and then 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 there were those that it was like nothing has happened I'm still posting like I posted in in March 12th of 2020 and I was like people get it together you know like at least acknowledge the fact that this is a shit show and it, you are extremely fortunate to be able to stand on stage, even if you're six feet apart from people. Does that make sense? This isn't normal. So I really appreciated those that um, that put it in a way that made me fe that made me want to root for them and say, yes, I'm so grateful that music is still happening. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, I mean, it's actually it's comforting to hear that because you don't, you know, everybody's experience is really different. And I think there's, you know, there also are a lot of singers. I've really been thinking a lot of, about singers in the states. Because it's been, I think it's been hardest for American singers based in the states, um, you know, with with U.S. houses just shut, completely shut, completely quiet, not really anything. Not it doesn't feel like many opportunities happening. Mm -hmm. um, I've I've been really worried about what that does for a lot of singers. I mean, a lot of people I think considering just leaving yep. the business. You yep. know, especially people that were maybe on the cusp anyway or mm -hmm. nearing just feeling yeah. like, is it worth it or not to keep going with this? Um, I think it's, it's sort of made the decision for them. Um, so yeah, but it's nice to hear that, that, yeah, yeah. You just, you never know how people are going to take it. Yeah. That I want to go back to what you said now about North American singers and North American opera houses. Cause I know that you have a big debut coming up at the Metropolitan Opera. Oh, is it happening or not? I no. just got word uh, last week that it is not happening, sadly. Eugenie on Tauride. They, have, they have had to cancel the production of Eugenie on Tauride. So sadly, that has landed on the chopping block. Um, and I don't know, I don't know, you know, what's happening with other productions. I think, I think in the end what they're having to do because they've gotten, they've sort of made all of these agreements with unions so late in the game, they just don't have enough time to put everything together. Wow. Because it's a um, production, right? Well, it's a Stephen Wadsworth production that's been around, but I think it's quite heavy with chorus. Um, um, I think the technical aspects are quite heavy. Okay. Um, I, and I think that is a big player in this. Um, it's it's all of that extra stuff that has to be done. Well, I think they're trying yeah, to do it. All the tech weeks too. Like if they just started rehearsals at the Met because they just finalized the last union, they didn't have any of that tech time to prep the show. So I bet a lot of the big shows are going to be cut this season. Oh yeah, and so? I mean also eighteen months not not having been opened at all. I mean, can you imagine sitting down to your desk and saying? Okay, where do we start? <laughs> it would be kind of like. <laughs> get all the dust off the desk. <laughs> okay, here we are. <laughs> Gonna pull the sheets off the desk and... <laughs> Seriously, I know it's... it's I, don't, I don't know how one even starts having been away from the house for such a long time. Um, I mean, people literally have not been able to walk into the building. Um, uh, I mean, they've been locked out. So um, 
I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it was, it was disappointing news. And at the same time, somehow I wasn't surprised either. Yeah. Um, because, because I, I had this sort of intuitive feeling that um, even if they were man, they would manage to have an opening to the season open on time. That would mean that some things might have to be sacrificed. So that Did was you about it. Did you learn the role? You know, I, I have to admit that I started working on it a bit last summer and then I put it down. Why did I put it down? Probably because we started to move um, in the autumn and mm -hmm. I got busier with the recording. Um, and then the, all the questions about whether the Met was going to open started to kick in. So my goal, because I had uh, basically this season like four new roles to Whoa. learn. Whoa. Um, and they were fairly back to back. So I decided my game plan, because I'm doing my first first Elevita. I know Carrie, you've, you're, you're known for your Elevita. So I'm doing my first one this autumn. Yeah. And, but what I'm going to do is work hard on that. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully by, by, you know, by June, I'll know something about the Ephesian E. So I'll learn the Elevita, then get the Ephesian E in, and then start to work on the next project. Um, because it is, it's becoming harder and harder to start a role that you feel like you don't yeah. know is, is it going to happen or not. There's so many things I've learned this season, like learned cold, and then it just didn't, didn't happen. happen. I know, and people don't understand how frustrating and depressing it is because you spend all this time, you know, getting it all ready, and then it's like, uh, no, sorry. Yeah. And time and money too. I mean, you you know spend spend uh, money on coaches and all of that to to really prep things and yeah. But I was I mean normally I would just go ahead and learn it because I just want to learn it. But actually time wise, it I and with people calling sort of last minute saying hey you want to do this one and do this one then like then I was learning things. I was having to learn a lot more at the last minute this this year as well. I'm, <laughs> I'm there right now. <laughs> What are you having to work are on? Are you going to admit it? <laughs> the Scottish play, the Scottish, the Scottish play, Macbeth. Yeah, I had I had mama drama to deal with too. So, yeah. I, the month that I had set aside to learn it was in, uh, involved moving my mother to a mental care facility and out of her large two bedroom, and she's slightly a hoarder. People. <laughs> oh no! Yay, mom! Thank but. Mom. I mean, but also it was, it went back and forth. It's happening. It's not happening. It's happening. It's happening. It's not happening. It's happening. It's not happening. And my debut was canceled last year. And so, you know, it went on the floor. I started working on it and went on the floor and it's like, now what? <laughs> really hard. It's like hard to get your motor going again. Yeah. And you feel like it, oh, okay. It, it might be happening. No, 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 no. <laughs> and you get a bit of a funk too, you know, it's, it's a little like, oh. Well, that yeah. was my time, so yeah, well. Yeah. I mean, I don't know necessarily what else I would have been doing with my time, because I do, I mean, I like studying, but at the same time, it's just, it's a really strange sensation to really not know to what end you're preparing something. Yep. Because uh, I think we are like goal oriented, you know, we know, okay, this is the day, and we look at our calendars and say, all right, these are the dates of, you know, of, of this contract. Now, during this contract, I need to manage to find time to work on this and this and this. But yeah. do you, want, do, do either of you, are you, are you good at learning roles while you're on the road singing something else? Because I really have to take time. I really have to like step into some performance. We say thumbs down. No, I, I a lot time. I think Carrie, you do too, right? To, to learn things and because I think when you're singing one thing, even if it's similar, yeah, you get. Nah. I I like to really focus 100 percent on what I'm doing. You, Carrie, uh, the music comes fast. The, I think that's just from piano at from five, you know, and being a playing instruments and stuff. The music comes fast. It's the words that are so extremely difficult for me. So that takes so much time and. When your brain is focused on one show, how do you and those words and making sure that all stays, you know 
correct and not dyslexia isn't coming in, but then to, you know, learn a new role. And what if it's in a different language and you're just like, can we yes. please bring back prompters? We need, we need prompters, people. Can we, can we talk about the foreign princess, Gary? <laughs> foreign princess, where it was like, we're, we're just going to send these on vowels, people. We might get five cons. Can I buy a vowel, please? Can I buy a vowel? Everything's going to be on ah uh, and o, oh, and then the rest of it, you might get a in there, but that's it. <laughs> Did you, did, you, did, you, did you do the were you were you the the cooks whatever the, the kitchen boy yeah kitchen boy, right? that's a great part i love that part i don't remember it at all except just like running around i don't know yeah. <laughs> okay. so what, any any dream roles like for, well but then let me backtrack you had a kid did it change your voice having a son Man, I wish it had. Like everybody talks about sort of like how, you know, all of a sudden their voice got so much more luscious and luxurious or something from having a kid. It didn't. I, I mean, it, it didn't, I don't think in a physical way, in a mental way, probably things have changed a little bit. Um, I mean, I even find sort of, I'm finding more as, as we're having to juggle a lot or even in the instance, just recently having to travel with him on my own, you know, I don't, I don't really like to do the live-in nanny situation, somebody traveling with you, because, you know, it's nice to have your time at night when, when, the, when he goes to bed, it's just nice to have that time. And so I was managing a lot with, with babysitters and, and coordinating all of that. But what I found was that I had to let go of a lot of the, a lot of the things I'd convinced myself I needed in order to work or in order to do the performance that evening. Um, like under normal circumstances, it'd be sort of like, okay, Ben needs to go out with someone in the morning, like the mm -hmm. performance day, I'm sort of not on but I, I really couldn't have a babysitter there for like, you know, 20 hours of the day. <laughs> that was a little too much to ask. So like I would do the morning with him and then they try to come early afternoon and take him out so I could get a nap. But, and I, I've just had to accept that um, a lot of, it, and that's been liberating in a way that I realized, oh, a lot of this stuff, maybe I've, I've sort of created in my mind that I need, that I need to have mm -hmm. in place, but it is not necessarily so. Um, and I don't have as much time to necessarily to also get sort of worked up about stuff or to be, think, you know, to overthink some of these things. I mean, my husband would not, <laughs> would not agree <laughs> with that. He thinks I overthink plenty and worry plenty, <laughs> but, um, but I just have less brain space, I think, for some of that. And that's not bad. That's maybe the um, silver lining to being yeah. like to being busy in any way um, is that you don't have as much time to get like uber anxious about things right. but um, but yeah now I've forgotten the question pandemic brain right like it's like shiny object like uh, <laughs> No, I don't, I don't, I'm just rambling and this is what I do. So bring me back, bring me back. No, I love that though. I mean, I think that, we, I think all of us have had our moments where you're like, oh, I didn't need to have those 17 things lined up to have a perfect performance. You know, it's like life happens people. But the one thing that I still do not do, and I don't know about you ladies, and we can cut this out if you want, is that I do not have sex the day of a performance. There's no way. Because my voice will drop to the basement and there will be no high notes. Um, do I want to ask why it's going to drop? <laughs> Terry, are you a screamer? Am I a screamer? We just have a really good time, people. So, um, uh, no, I tried it. It didn't work. And then I was like, yeah, that's never happening again. So no, mm -mm. I would just take to be one of those people that was in the audience that day. Like, can I get my money back? Cause she had, <laughs> it and was. I mean, it was like, why isn't she, why is she called a soprano? She should be a contralto. I mean, come on. <laughs> I never, no, I've never, I don't think I've ever on the day of a show. It might've been a long time ago, but I don't know. I, I mean, how can you even sort of relax enough to even give it a go? <laughs> oh, exactly. oh, girl, what you talking about? It's just like, make it down. <laughs> so I'm going to say,
segue che yeah, yeah. Green rolls. <laughs> yes, you have bucket list rolls. Yeah. Oh god. Um Oh, I'm always, uh, the, I think probably one of them that I, I really want to be able to do one day is Didon in Les Troyens. Like that would be, that's, that's, that's one of the big ones. Um, I'm sure there are others. I, I'd love to, you know, if, if the sort of opportunity voice allows, I'd like to do a bit more bel canto as well, because for a lyric mezzo, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of a slim, little bit. I've done um, Romeo and Capuletti Montecchi. I loved that. Um, uh, but I've only done it in concert. So I'd really love to do a stage version of it. Whoa, um, okay. And I even got to try Leonor and uh, La Favorite. And that was sort of that was a stretch. But I, it's been nice in some moments just to stretch a little bit and to see, see what Sandra's world is like. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is Carrie, Carrie's done. She did Giovanna Seymour to my honest. That's honor. true. That's true. Yeah. Yep. yeah. And, and, and she's right. right. Giovanna Seymour is harder than Anna Bolena. I, I looked at that like some years ago to see if that would ever be in the future. And that, that looks, that looks pretty scary. I thought, I mean, I thought Anna was hard because I've done both, but Jane kicked my booty. Wait, and so, so those Carrie, were, Going from going from Mozart because you you you've done Elvira and you're known for your Elvira and going into the bel canto. What's your what's your feeling sort of about? Have you had to do that ever back to back, or do they move into each other quite easily? Yes. How's your what's your yeah. feeling on that? The hardest things are when you go from Tosca or Butterfly or something like that back into Mozart or back into the bel canto because it's just different. Yeah. So Mozart and, and all of those bel canto ladies to me are in that same, I don't know, tunnel, the same line, the same everything. It's just lined up in that way because you can't move the voice and get to the top, have the top and the bottom even without that, in my opinion. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, it was, it's, it's the same. So I would warm up with Mozart before singing Alda Giza or before singing Anna. I still yeah. warm up with Mozart before I walk out and sing Butterfly just to make sure that I haven't overblown it from the night before singing Butterfly or whatever. Does that make and sense? And then when you come, you're coming back from the bel canto, then what do you need to do to put yourself, I mean, is there something you need to do or time you need to take if you're gonna be moving into a Mozart role? You mean from one of the big ones or from yeah. bel canto, from yeah. the- it's like, a, you, it's, do you have to say to your manager, I need two weeks before I, before yeah, I, you can't, I can fly to, to yes, I do. Yes, because if you don't, sometimes you show up to a rehearsal and you're singing Butterfly like Donna Elvira and they're like, or vice versa. Vice versa. Yeah. You know, where Donna Elvira is like Brunhilda and you're like, what are you doing? Why did you do this this way? So yeah. Um, yeah, that first aria in Don Elvira after a big sing of Verdi of Puccini is like, whoa, whoa, girl, yeah. rein it in. Yeah, but Brunhilde E, I bet. Yeah, it's a little, mm -hmm. But yeah. those, I have to say for anybody, any mezzos that are listening to this, those roles are really soprano roles. I didn't, those arias, like Alda Jesus' mm -hmm. prayer does not represent the entire role. And you as Alda Jesus have to be able to sing that role in three different keys because you never know what the soprano is going to sing the duet in. So you have to know oh, that yeah. you can sing it. Uh, your high note's either going to be a high C, a B natural, or a B flat because it's all about her. It's not about you. So you have to be able to, and people will love you for that if you can do all of it. So yeah. To really, to gosh, that's interesting. I did yeah. not know that. Yeah, well, it's 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 it can be an issue. <laughs> it can it can be an issue. Well, yeah. I mean, from your perspective, Sandra, have you sort of walked in and then it goes into like a negotiation process, or is it like, nope, this is my key? You, you never should... happened before. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, the opera's called Norma. Just yeah. gonna. Say yeah, yeah, yeah. In my opinion, the high key is the best because it sounds different. I don't know if Carrie agrees, but it's way Norma, fun. the duet in the high key has a brilliance and there's a reason why he wrote it in that key. If you take it down a half tone or a whole tone, Oof. it 
sounds, it doesn't sound positive, it sounds negative. And I really think there's a reason why composers wrote things in the case that they wrote. But yeah. that's, yes, it, but it is, is, it is a bit like war negotiations, you know, when, <laughs> when you walk into rehearsals and you have a mezzo that's like, um, um, I'm so under- this is my thing is like, why, why isn't it discussed beforehand? That's what I don't understand. Why isn't anybody asking these ladies, you know, what, what is what? So, yeah. but also the, the other side of it is you don't want your colleague to look bad. So, yeah. you know, sometimes you make concessions and for the better of the whole show. And I think, you know, that you have to do that mm. sometimes. I've had I've had uh, experience of experiences of that actually when I was singing Zerlina and Don Giovanni and oh. as a mezzo because you know also lyric mezzos will sing Zerlina but then you know whoever's casting has to understand that if the mezzo is singing Zerlina then you really need the soprano singing El Vida because there's issues of lines and right. get switched around right and I've had a couple times where they've cast it sort of mezzo and mezzo and then there's this whole sort of like Ooh, i don't want to take that top line are you going to take that top line in the finale and it's a little like well maybe we'll just rely on donna on that <laughs> just awkward conversations about oh are we gonna have to switch these lines around um but then yeah yeah can I circle back so though to something that we were talking about earlier? Because I was wondering. Sorry, I, I have questions. Oh, I'm yeah, like, <laughs> interview the divas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or chill. But do you find it hard if if you're looking at your season and you've got you know you know you've got these sort of these big things coming on? Mm -hmm. Is it is it hard? Do you find it hard when when stuff is coming in to say nope? I need that month to do this? Are you constantly sort of pulled up? Well, maybe I could just give a week. No, here. no, that, that's where a good manager, I find, comes mm -hmm. into play. And a manager that really understands how you learn music yeah. and understands how much time you need off. The, Jonathan understands that I am not a person that can go, you know, boom, 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 boom. He understands that I need time allotted and I, for, to learn new music. So it took a while for us to, you know, get that relationship. There are managers who just want to push and push and push. And the hardest word I've always said in this business is no. It's so easy to say, yes, yeah, I can do that. I can do that. And to have that person, like Carrie has her husband, Chris, I have my husband, Duncan. I don't know how involved your husband is in, in your career, but to have my husband say, Sandra, if you do that, you are really going to regret doing that because you are going to do this before and you're going to do that and you're going to be burnt out by the time you get to that. And it's yeah. that voice of reason. But yeah, it's it's hard, especially now after us not working, like we, we've all been used to working for the last 18 months. It's so tempting to say, you know, maybe I can just fit that in. And you know, I, it's going to be extra money, but I always think, what are the consequences of saying yes? And, we also long, talk and what does it look like for the long picture as well? Right, always. Sort of just, just stamina and um, like trying to look at the long picture of it all because it's so easy to say yes. Like it's easy to say yes, even a couple years in, in advance, say, oh, I, could, I can manage that. And then you get to it and you sort of get to the middle of it or three quarters of the way through it and you're like, why did I? And also, now think about it. We're we're all getting older, me especially, and the feminine, the female body. I'm just going to throw it out there. The female body changes, our hormones change, our voices change. So something that we may have all said yes to five years ago, we get to it, and then we go. Yeah. Harry, you, you had something to say. Sorry. No, I, I also think that there's this thing, and I don't know if it's a female thing, if it's an American thing, I'm not quite sure, because we're people pleasers, and we want to make the companies happy, and the intendants happy, and so when they're like, oh, you, you have to be here, and then you show up, even though you've got XYZ going on, and you show up, and then half the cast isn't there, 
because they've taken care of themselves and decided I can't make this because la la la. And so you're thinking, why am I the one that is carrying this ball when no one else showed up? So or they just think, don't show up because they don't show up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I have a new contract that I, would, I was just given to sign. And it says for every day of rehearsal that you're missing, 5% of your fee is being taken away. Wow. This is so now, now we're, so now those of us that always show up are being penalized for all of those that never that show up the day of dress final dress rehearsal. This is a brand new thing in a contract. I don't I'm I'm I don't know that I'm opposed to that because I feel like there I what's frustrated me many times is you show up to a city, usually it's a pretty expensive city where you have to pay for your housing. Yes. And you show up and you're there for the five, six weeks of rehearsal. But then, but then the big star is not, just doesn't seem to be there. And where are they? Oh, I don't know. They said they were going to come, but nope, they're not there. You see them on, then you see them on a concert, a gala concert or something, and it's all over Instagram and you go, sick. Yeah. Right. And, and I think it's really, I think it's bad to all of the people, you know, you know, a lot of people that are not getting to do all the starring roles, but they're still having to pay to be in the city and to be in rehearsals and people aren't there. I think it's just, it's sort of wrong to the, the team, yeah. you know, to the yeah. sort of cohesive whole. And I'm not necessarily opposed to that. I'm curious, is that a European con uh, company that's doing that? I wonder if that's going to become the norm. I, and it's brand new. It's a brand new contract. And oh. I said, okay, that's, you know, it's great. And I agree with it for most of those people, but I have an ill mother. That's true. Yes. Are you going to ding or are you going to ding me for that? Yeah. yeah. Like, and I, you know, we're honest people. Carrie knows, you know, Carrie knows that I don't show up late to rehearsals. Yeah. But God forbid, what if something happened to my mom or, you know, you have a four-year-old son. Carrie, you know, you have a dog and a husband. What if something happened to them? Is there an exception to this or, That's you know, a, really you point. a letter from the doctor? Or... Yeah, I mean, family emergencies should not fall under that. You know, if you're just not showing up, be, but I guess then people are just going to make documentation that. and have a family yeah. emergency. So they, that's it, 5% <laughs> of your fee Ole per day. That's a lot, 5% of your fee. That's like, Pretty Isn't Come it? Come on. Oh my gosh. This is getting crazy. Is it time to just go be a lawyer? I think it's time. I think it's time to just go back to school and do something else. <laughs> I'm getting I mean, that's really That's really tricky actually, because I, I really understand both sides of it. But yeah, if there's an emergency, then, then what? you are an honest person who's not going to pull their chain. Yeah. I'm not one of those people, you know, that, that has allergies or, you know, ear infection, ear infection, I mean, whatever, you know, but explosive diarrhea. That's my favorite. Yeah, <laughs> favorite. <laughs> someone, used, someone used that. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. That's the best excuse you can ever give is explosive diarrhea. Cause nobody, we're probably going to cut this. Nobody gives you a hard time because everybody understands what that is and they don't want you anywhere near the theater with explosive diarrhea it's real poo real. Real. oh on that note <laughs> i'm sorry and i can't take credit for that that was a manager my first time where i was like i couldn't like my i had such horrible cramps and what i just i knew that i couldn't do that rehearsal it was standing in a heavy costume for hours under lights and i was just like i can't and um and I was honest. And then of course my manager gets a phone call and he's like, why in the world would you ever use that excuse? You, uh, you only say explosive diarrhea, basta. That's our, that's our joke now. You yeah. know, when I say, oh, Carrie, I gotta go to this rehearsal. She's like, girl, can't you have explosive diarrhea? Shouldn't there be like an, a poop emoji that's like, <laughs> I mean, not say more. I'm just gonna send you that. Off the rails we've gone, like seriously. <laughs> Okay, I have one more question. We we have one more question, and then we're gonna let you go because we know you have a child to take care of. But your husband sounds like a super cool guy. Yeah. How did how did you meet and like documentary? And he does documentaries of like serious seriously. He was a big deal. 
Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, fairly randomly, although maybe very modernly, we met um, on the internet, on, oh. on a, a dating site. I basically, I was in London, um, living in London, and a friend of mine, you know, I was married before and was divorced, and that had been, that had really sort of been a a jarring experience in life. Sorry, the storm is starting. You might hear some thunder. Um, and and I had moved to, to London and been single for a while. And a friend of mine said, you know, you need to, you need to get back out there and just try. It's mainly about, it's not about finding the man of your dreams or anything, but it's about reminding yourself that there are nice guys out there. Mm. There are nice people out there. And you you just need to be reminded of that to be able to sort of, get, get your, your, your sort of toes wet. Mm -hmm. And so, um, she made a good point. I thought, all right, well, I'll give it a shot. Um, and I, I was around in London for a few months. Um, so I thought I'd give it a shot. And then within just a few days, Ollie popped up and he'd never done anything like this as well. He had been probably seven, eight months out of a relationship too. And, um, and we met, Actually, the story was kind of funny because he was working on a film at the time for the BBC and we realized that it was going to be quite hard to meet in person. I had to go to Salzburg for the concert, all of this. And he just said, I'm going to come to Salzburg for the weekend and meet you. And I was like, oh, no, 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 don't do that. <laughs> I was like, this is, this is too much because it's like, you know, it's like we're going to meet each other and then be disappointed. And then we're going to have to hang out with each other for the whole <laughs> the whole weekend don't do that and and then but we were having such great conversations on the phone that we thought well we better just get the disappointment done with so that we can move on with our lives uh-huh <laughs> so he got this flight out to Salzburg which he was saying oh it's not expensive at all but I, it was no, later I found out that it was actually quite expensive for him to get this last minute flight and I finished rehearsal one day and we met in the middle of this bridge, one of the bridges in Salzburg and went and had dinner. And it was actually really awkward that night. Like he was sort of, his physicality was a little bit awkward. It was quite funny. And, um, but then we got together the next day and he said he'd gotten a little bit of like coaching from his sister saying, Ollie, stand tall, walk tall. You can do this. You're a catch. It was, really, it was quite funny. And then he, he was, he was a bit different the next day. And I invited him in to watch um, a rehearsal. And I usually never, I would never like bring a lot of personal life into rehearsal space, but it was interesting. I was quite, I was quite taken with the fact that he went into that space and he actually really engaged with the people as, you know, a documentary filmmaker, he's asking people about their period instruments and, oh, the dialogue here is, you know, fascinating. And how did you write this? And he wanted to know more and he engaged with people. And it wasn't like, oh, I need to worry about how he's doing sitting there in the chair. Awesome. Like, you know, I, did, I didn't have to worry about how he functioned in that space. And it just, we turned out to have a great time. And it just, in, in a way, our sensibilities and, and what we do, we, we understand so much of what we do with work. Um, and I really admire him. He's, he's, he is courageous and he's done, he mm. is part of his work. He has to go into some really deep, dark stuff and he knows, he really knows how to talk to people and, and how to make people safe in, in talking about, you know, some of their, some, some big things that have happened in their lives. Yeah. Um, and he's, he's, he's creative and he loves the process of creation and cool. he's helped me so much with the albums doing the videos for the albums and awesome. um and he loves doing it he loves being a part of that side the behind the scenes of, yeah. of music and engaging with everyone so Aww. um he's he is a he's a wonderful partner I feel very lucky to have gotten a second chance love that that's amazing how cool is that, especially in this new world of opera that we're going into that's becoming so digital, you have yeah. someone who has that brain that understands this and can help you navigate through all that, which we're all, you know, everybody's kind of like, what? So yeah, I know. I mean, he has, he has the technical brain for it. He has the equipment 
as well. <laughs> and I don't know anything about it. It's just, it's so far, far beyond me. But he's right now he's working on a Netflix documentary, like a three part Netflix documentary. So I'm not asking him for, for right. much because he's, he's fully focused on that at the moment. Um, so I'm trying to make sure that he has the time and space to, to put himself fully into that project. I love that. I love that you guys understand that about each other. I think that's the hardest part within a relationship with someone who is, wants to be a part of this insanity that we're in, in our business world that, but you understand each other and that's brilliant. I love that. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't mean we don't have challenges oh, with girl. scheduling and all of that, but, yeah. but knowing why it's important to the other person is, um, is really vital to understand that it's, that is part of what makes the blood flow. <laughs> like, you know, to the, that makes, that gives life, life force to that person. They need that in their yeah. lives. And to, and to be able to embrace that and encourage it is really important. That's awesome. I'm happy. For you. We love it. Okay. You might have a few more minutes for rapid fire. Carrie's on her bouncy ball today, by the oh, way. Oh, that's right. Oh my God, I'm bouncing. I'm Carrie's sorry. On her bouncy ball. Oh gosh. Okay. All right. Rapid fire. Okay. Ready? Rapid fire. Ready. Three words that best describe you. Um. Uh. Deep. Uh. Thoughtful. Um. <laughs> Um, indecisive. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Okay. What is the one question that you would love to ask your favorite opera star, opera singer? No, I know what I would say. Oh, you do? What, what would you say? I would want to ask Maria Callas how she dealt with fame. Um, That's good. Oh, so it could be living. It could be living. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. I mean, I think I'd, I think I'd probably want to ask something to the effect, you know, looking back on the whole career, I'd, I'd want to sort of, sort of retrospectively ask them, you know, if they sort of could start with, could start knowing what they know now, what, what would it look like? What would they change? Good question. Yeah. What three things do you have to do every day? <laughs> Drink coffee. Um, uh, uh, cuddle with my kid. Definitely, I got to do that. Um, and take some time to just breathe. <laughs> right? Woo saw people, woo saw it out. Okay, most embarrassing wardrobe malfunction in a show. Hmm. I feel like I've been really lucky in that regard. No way. Out of even like competitions, like everything you've done. I can't recall anything where I was, I can't, no. I mean, I, I, the, the most sort of shocking thing was like when I walked off stage and straight into a post. And so I, <laughs> <laughs> because I was blinded from the lights and, and, and I just couldn't see anything and I just went boom right into it. So I had a big egg on my head, but I can't think of anything. I can't think That's of anything with a, with a costume malfunction. Isn't that crazy? That's no, okay. Dude. You're lucky. You are lucky. Do you have any secret talents? Um, I can do some jump roping. I can do some interesting tricks with a jump rope because I was on a jump rope team when I was little. So like double Dutch, double Dutch, uh, like double Dutch, but uh, just even single rope, you know, I can do the legs up and, you know, oh. triple unders and stuff like that. I, I've been known to do a few, a few. Well, you can sing while you're planking. So, I mean, seriously, <laughs> Thank you, David Picker. I sort of, I didn't have any choice. They just said, well, that's what you're going to do. And I was like, all right, well then that's what I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna think about it otherwise. <laughs> David was very impressed with it. I'm sorry, but David would have needed to demonstrate it first before I did it. <laughs> Just saying, David, love you, but you would have needed to done it. I asked him in a month, so I'm gonna ask him to do that. <laughs> please do, please do. David, would you, would you like display that please? Yeah. <laughs> okay, what is one thing that you have tried that you will never do again? I don't, I don't 
don't think I have anything like, well, probably it'd probably be more like being, I think for me, my big shift in life was like being way more honest and like not, not constantly being yes, yes, yes about stuff, Mm. but setting my boundaries has been probably. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah. First celebrity crush. Uh, Brad Pitt. (laughs) Like huge crush, huge crush. Okay. Um, like even now or back, what was that movie? With back the then, Legends of the Fall. Oh, yes. yeah. Well, it started with The River Runs Through It and then moved into Legends of the Fall, yeah. yeah we, could, we could just have a moment for that. Like moment hot of hotness. Yes. Oh, Brad Pitt. Yes. <laughs> Can we do the last question, Kiri? Oh, uh, oh, no, we have two. What is your favorite cuss word in any language? Oh. Uh, it's, it's probably fuckers. <laughs> I just have to do like fuckers. Jazz hands, right? You have to have the jazz hands with it. Like, Like, uh okay. Last question. question. If heaven exists, what do you want to hear God say as you enter the pearly gates? Oh my gosh, this is from the actors. um, Yes, actor studio. Actor studio. Love that show. Um. God. <laughs> um, uh, that's t- oh my gosh, that's tough. It's tough when somebody asks it, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It is because I've heard so many people answer it. Um, uh, God, I don't. I'm so stuck, guys. I'm so stuck on this. Um, uh, Maybe I would say, say, uh, I guess I'd say, you know, good job, kid. You learned how to fall down and then you learned how to get back up again. Cool. Love excellent that. answer. Really excellent. We love that. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Sorry for all the hemming and hawing. <laughs> well, okay. Like, That's listen. what editing's for, girl. We just cut that right out. <laughs> yay, yay. That's why, that's why we don't do a live show. Yep. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yep. yep. Well, thank you so much. Really, oh, it's fabulous to see you and your new hair too. Oh my God, thanks. Yeah, it's love amazing. it. I have a lot more volume than I ever had before because it's short. It just it goes up now. So you have a lot of hair. It's so thick. I had no idea how thick it was until they chopped it off, Ooh. and it was just yeah. It's. Just, I love it. It looks great on you. Oh, yeah, thanks. don't change it. Thanks. It needs, it needs some sculpting, but I just, I haven't gotten around to that quite yet. It's good. <laughs> good Baby steps. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. One thing at a time. Yeah. yeah. Take care of yourself. Good to see Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being a part of our shenanigans. Hey, yes. Thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Of course. Yeah. Take awesome. care and we will hopefully see you in person soon. I know. Wouldn't yes. that be lovely? Stay Adieu. safe. Right, Thank bye. you. Too. Bye. 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 Leo, can you hear me? Okay, she doesn't hear me. Um, how's that? So, oh no. <laughs> do I need to pull it back? Yes. It carries like, yes, yes you do. Where's your singing? I got it right here. Oh. Yes, you do. It's like, it's a little out of control. That's good. Are you center though a little bit? You I'm always off center. Yes, you are. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with that. And I'm on my I'm on my bouncy ball today. You're on your bouncy ball? Okay. Is everything good there, then? Yeah. Now we're good. good. Okay.